This week has been probably one of the busiest weeks in my 16 years of being a pastor here. The week started with uh, doing Lois Wainick's funeral, and then I spent literally all week in the hospital with uh, Jacqueline Carroll's family, uh, her mom, Cameron Barbosa, went to be with the Lord on uh, Friday in our dear friend Nancy Saluka is somehow still alive and not in glory. Uh, we gathered, I gathered with the family on Wednesday night, and they thought she was going to die Wednesday night, and they thought she was going to die Thursday and Friday and Saturday. And, um, and then in between all that, Mike Pickett, gentleman that's here, 47 years old, two little girls, had open heart surgery. Um, and so he's doing well, continue to pray for Mike. And so needless to say, this week, I had very little time to prep. There's no notes, and we have a limited PowerPoint that uh, we're going to do here. So, um, but I want you to know, when, when you're with families, and it's my privilege to be with families when, when someone's dying, I wish I could take every young person and take them into those rooms because there is something that is amazing when a believer is dying. When someone that you know without a shadow of a doubt loves Jesus, have lived their lives for Jesus, have impacted people for Jesus, it's a glorious thing. And what you will see is when people walk into the room that, that don't get it, they don't get it. Because there's no hope. I sat there, read scripture after scripture, but one of them I read is, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, it says, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary. What you see right now, look around. It's all temporary. But what is unseen is eternal. And it says this in chapter 5, verse 1. Now we know, now we know if this earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan. So right now, Nancy lies in the bed and is groaning. And it seems like it's been real long. But in, 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 in the length of eternity, it is a light, and momentary trouble. And so is your life. It's a vapor. It is a vapor. You're here, and, and then you're going to be gone. So we've been in this series that we have called Walking uh, with Jesus. And I'll just show you. That, that's the, the slide here. Um, and I got one big, one big theme that I want us to, to know today. And that is, I want you to have beautiful feet. And you say, beautiful feet, my feet are ugly. Well, let me read a passage. In, in Romans chapter 10, verse 13, it says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how, I, how are they to hear without someone preaching and how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. We're all preachers here. I'm a preacher. You're a preacher. Whether you like it or not, you preach. Your life preaches. And if you're here today and you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you got a job to do. If you're here and you're not a Christian, I get it. You're going to live for you and you're going to preach that life's all about you. I get that. And there's sadness that is there. But for those of us that are here that are as Christians, we have marching orders. We have a purpose. We know that we are to be his witnesses. Matter of fact, over and over again, it's very clear. In, in Acts chapter 1, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you, believer, will be my witness in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, to the ends of the earth. That's why what we're doing 
with missions this week and with the, the Jesus film. That's why we do. We're not only here, but around the world. Jesus said before he left, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Now you would think, you would think that if you're here today and you're a Christian who has been loved by God, that you have been rescued out of darkness. You have been delivered from the bondage of sin. You no longer will spend eternity in hell. And if you don't like me using the word hell, you got to get over it because Jesus talked about hell more than he talked about heaven. That's, that's the truth. But he has done that for us. He has rescued us by, by faith in him, Christ, in faith alone, by Christ alone, in him alone, that we have eternal life. And you would think that every one of us would be super passionate about making him known. My first ministry job when I left Xerox full-time in 1995, I was the pastor of outreach and education. And my job was to try to ignite a fire in the church so people would share their faith. And can I tell you, back in 1995, that was not easy. Oh, there were people that were there that were passionate about getting Jesus out there, but not, you'd be surprised how many people weren't. Now, fast forward 24 years. How are things today? Is it, is it easier to try to get you excited about telling people about Jesus? I read a recent uh, poll from, from Barna and the creators of the Alpha Course who had some really kind of scary news. There's a trend that says the 20-somethings and the 30-somethings who are now, they're basically, they're becoming a new leadership of the church. Nearly half, 47% of practicing Christian millennials, these are churchgoers who consider religion an important part of their lives, believe that evangelism is wrong. Now, I, when I read those surveys, I'm going, really? I don't think any of our young people believe that evangelism's wrong. If you think that, I'm going to take you out back and I'm going to give you a wedgie. I don't know what to say. Is that, is that wrong to say, Jim? Am I in trouble? I don't know. But evangelism is wrong? No. I mean, so the, the surveys, if, if you think it's wrong, you don't get the gospel. You, you just don't. But I'm, I know you don't think it's wrong. But what I'm concerned is we get so busy with life. You're working. You're chasing after kids. You're doing life. You got people to care for. You got stuff going on. We, I mean, and we, we sometimes get more passionate about us and our activities and watching, binge watching our shows and going to our restaurants or being on our diet or, you know, we get so busy that we don't keep the main thing the main thing. So, my job this morning is to passionately to say, I want you to have beautiful feet. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5 and and we're not going to read that for a little bit, but if we can advance to the next slide. There's um, two verses that I want us to look at. John chapter 8 and verse 12 says, Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And that's pretty clear. And then, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, it says, In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. I want to start with, the, with the Roman, or in John chapter 8, where he does say, where Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Jesus is the light. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, it says, This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Jesus is the light. There's no other light. There's no other way. 
In John chapter 1, in verse 9, it says, The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. If you're here today, if you're here today, you're a child of God. And we just studied through Ephesians, and in five eight it says, "For at one time you were darkness; now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light." That's what we're called to be. We are. You and I are called. You and I. Everyone thinks, of course, that's what you. You do that. That's your job. But let me just point at you and say, Christian. You are to let your light shine. For the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. In John 8, verse 12, it says, Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. What is darkness? Darkness represents falsehood. It represents sin. And we used to live that way. But now we're called to be light. We are called to be different. A genuine Christian is to walk habitually in the truth and in the light and in holiness. I'm not saying we're perfect. We, we don't do this perfectly. But that should be where we're doing and what we're doing every single day. And there's a battle that goes on. Because there's times when our activities are, are not right. But we turn, we repent from those, and we, again, walk in the light. It, a scary trend in America, and really it's around the world, it's nothing new, but there continues to be this movement that says to Christians, there's churches right now that are preaching, ah, sin, what... Sin is what you think is wrong, not what the Word of God says is wrong. And so literally what churches have done really around the world is they put their finger to the culture and said, I don't think that that's wrong. And they have changed the guidelines and the rules, and they have changed what God says. But I, the problem with that is you can't do that. Those who Jesus has saved, he tells, you are to walk in light. You are to not walk in darkness. And we are to be different. In 1 John 1, 6, it says, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. And so my warning, my pastoral warning to all of us is if you say you're, you're in light and you walk in darkness... Your life is lying and you're not practicing the truth. And we are called to put off the works of darkness and to put on the armor of light, it says in Romans 13 and verse 12. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more in, in a second here. But God has called us to be light. Now, let's look at that passage in, in Matthew chapter 5. Starting in verse 14, it says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. I mean, you get, you get the imagery here. You're on a hill. You don't take a light that is meant to be illuminating the darkness. You don't sit there and cover it up. You don't do that. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a, a basket but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. It's very simple. We were once darkness, now we're light in the Lord, and now you and I have a job to do, Christian, is to let our light shine and to bring the good news to those that are in darkness. We, we can't conceal this. We have to be what God has called us to be. So the goal of our life 
should be to shine. Should be to take as many people to heaven as we can. And we don't take them there. We are God's instruments that give them the word of God that they would hear and believe. But you know who he uses? He uses us. We are his plan A. Now, let's get a little practical here. Turn over, if you can, to Philippians chapter 2, verse 14. Because I really do think that if you make this an item of prayer in your life, in your life, there, there's people that you know. Some of you go to the gym. They're your neighbors. They're your family members. They're your friends. Some of you have had friends for decades. They might know you're, you're a Christian. They might know. You, you, you rub elbows with people all the time. In Philippians chapter 2, and verse 14, here's what it says. Do all things without grumbling and disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Now this is, this is written over 2,000 years ago. And it's more twisted and more crooked. That, but that's the generation we live in. And here is where your life, your testimony, in your business dealings, you should be the most honest person in whatever industry you're in. And I don't care if, if everyone in your industry does something where they cut curves and they cut corners and, you know, this is what everyone does. You're a Christian. You're to, you're to let your light shine. And when we don't, you know what the, the world of darkness says? They look at a Christian and they say, hypocrite, you're, you know, you're just like me. We are to be uniquely different in the way we do business, in the way we interact with our neighbors, and that can be hard. In the way you interact at school, we are called to be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights. And that even means that when you do something wrong, you repent. You apologize to an unbeliever, and many times their jaw will drop because they're not used to it. And again, what I, what I find, because I, I live in the world, I, I'm, I'm with you, I get it. It's so easy to go sideways and act like the world does and do what the world does. And, and I've, I've heard business people say, well, if you don't do that, then, then you're not going to make the money. Oh, well. What would you rather have? Lots of money in the bank, good retirement plan, and a rotten testimony? So we, as all people, were to shine as lights. And it doesn't mean it's going to be easy, because the, the darkness, they don't like the light. It says, in, uh, Jesus said in John 3, 19, the, this is the verdict, light has come into the world but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds are evil. So yes, brothers and sisters, we're called to be different. Now, there's another, another practical thing to, to realize. Do you realize that the eternal destiny of the people that are sometimes your best friends... It's heaven or hell. In John 3.36, Jesus said, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. The wrath of God remains on him. When I first started reading these kind of passages, I thought, hmm, that's interesting. I ran across a quote by uh, Charles Spurgeon, and he said this, you never truly found Jesus if you do not tell people about him. Let me read that again. 
You have never truly found Jesus if you do not tell others about him. And at first I thought, well, that's a little harsh. And then I said, not really. If you love somebody, you're going you're gonna to warn them. I, when I do my ride-alongs with the police, on days like today when it's super windy and rainy, somewhere in the city, there's a downed wire. Just can guarantee you there's a downed wire somewhere. We get the call. We go over there, and we put out the warning tape all the way around the perimeter of where that wire is, any fence that would be touching it. We go to the doors, and we, and we warn them to say, careful, there's a downed wire. Don't go out back. Don't touch the fence. You could get electrocuted, and you'll be a French fry. You will, you'll, they'll, you'll sizzle. Don't do it. So you give this big warning. If they're not there, you put a little note. It would be like you. Going home today, because it's a windy day, and there's a little note that says, hey, there's a downed wire in your backyard on your fence. Do not, do not go back there. And you have a little five-year-old. And you say to the five-year-old, okay, go out play in the back. Would you do that? Even the sickest parent out here, you're not going to do that. Why? Because you love them. And the last thing in the world you want is for the one you love to get electrocuted. That'd be terrible. Electrocution is nothing compared to the punishment that unbelievers have awaiting them. It is far, far worse. They're going to be in outer darkness. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And this is all the stuff that Jesus talked about. And if I, if I don't love you, and I don't warn you, then I really don't love you. And I've, I, I talk to tons of people all the time, and, and the big concern is, well, I don't want to push them away. Well, yeah, don't be an idiot about it. But as a believer, you're to constantly be praying, be looking for open doors, be, be finding ways to even bring someone else into that person's life that would be able to share with them the good news of the gospel. There's a... Another quote by Spurgeon, and if you could advance to the next slide. It says this, it says, If sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our bodies. If they perish, let them perish with our arms around their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, at least let it be filled in the teeth of our exertion, and let no one go there unwarned or un." prayed for. I I love that quote. I've used it before. Because that's the truth. You can't can't do it for them, but they should know in a very kind way that you love them, and that's the last thing in the world that you would want for them. Because in reality, everyone's going to one of two places. Everyone. You're either going to be absent from the body and present with the Lord, which is far better, or you're going to the worst kind of punishment that you have ever seen or observed. I've, I've talked to people who say, well, I'm living hell on earth. And it's like, hey, buddy, you have no clue. You have no clue. We live in Disneyland. We really do. Even, I mean, even the poorest person here really lives in Disneyland compared to what hell will be like. So pray that God would open your heart. And, and, and you do got to be ready. That in 1 Peter chapter 3, if you can move to the next slide, it says, <clears throat> But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you, Do it with gentleness and respect. Don't get in arguments. You cannot muscle anyone into the kingdom, but you do it. You share the good news. You give people the reason for the hope that is in you, and you do it with gentleness and respect. Here's my prayer, is that, that you would look at your life and say, first of all, at my school, at my work, Am I known for for being someone who is ethical, who is truthful, who is truly a light? 
If you, if you don't have that, may today be the day where God just twists you and says, wait a minute, you're a Christian. Live like one. Live like a Christian neighbor. Don't be grumbling and complaining and disputing. Be light. So, so be that. And let God use you. Let your light shine. So I go back to my last two verses that I put up there first. If we can go to that next slide. And Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Matthew 5, 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they would see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. The end game is not that people would think that you're great. The end game is that you would give the glory to him for what he has done. Because he's the God of the universe that loves you and saves you. He's the one that made the truth, the clarity of the gospel known to you. This isn't religion. This is the truth of who Jesus is. And he has saved us, and we want to make him known. I am excited about what God does here. There's a lot of good things that, that we have happening. Everything from the SOAR program to incarcerated youth to well, now we have the Jesus uh, film weekend coming in where, where people get a passion that life's not about us. So may God work in our lives. Let's just bow our heads. And why don't you just evaluate your hearts to say in your school, in your neighborhood, in your work, in your family, are you living as a light? Or are you like the world in some ways? And then, and the, the real question of, do I love people enough to pray and engage them and, and be different around them that they would see the truth of who Jesus is and then share with them the hope that is found in Jesus Father, you know every heart. You know to whom some of us have been hiding our light under a basket. Lord, may we take the basket off. Some of us have been cutting corners or being doing things the way the world does at school, at work. Lord, let us not do that. Let's not be like this twisted and perverse generation. May we shine as lights in a dark world. Lord, give us a passion for those that don't know you. And Lord, encourage the hearts. Lord, there's many, many, many that are here that do let their light shine. I pray that you would give them fruit for their labor. Lord, I know that there's many loved ones and many friends that we've been praying for for years. And we know that it's, the story is not done yet. And so I pray that you would open people's hearts to the truth of who you are. Lord, help us not to grow weary in doing well, for in due season we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. And Lord, give us your love for those that don't know you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to do something a little different. Um, video, can you go back to uh, the medley? And the song, Rescue of the Perishing. I'd like to relive that. You want to come out and help us sing? Get our minds off of ourselves, onto those that need us. 
Sing this. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. Weep on the erring one, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus the mighty to save. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Down in the human heart, down in the human heart, rushed by the tempter. Touched by a loving heart, wakened by kindness, chords that are broken will vibrate once more. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful. Jesus will save. Lord, we do praise you that you are merciful and you will save and you have ordained that we would be your lights. Lord, may this church be on the hill and shine bright the gospel of Jesus. And may collectively as we go into our lives, may we be lights in a dark world. People need you. And may we be your means that we give them the good news. And me, may you draw them, may you open their blind eyes for your glory. Lord, thank you that you will build your church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And we give you the glory in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Rescue the perishing. Rescue the perishing. Care for the dying. Jesus is merciful. Jesus will save. Rescue. Tell the story 